Incoming transmission. The Klingonese word of the day is cho. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. So, this is a huge victory for the good guys. Scotty, beam me up. Resistance is futile. Live long and prosper. Podcast, the show covering the entire Star Trek franchise in chronological order for fans new and old. I'm your host, writer comedian Mr. Todd A. Davis. She is the dilithium in my nacelles. She is your executive producer and my sun, moon, and stars. It's Cat Davis. Yay! Aww. Cat Davis. Hey, everybody. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Thanks for coming back. You're welcome. Uh, here we are, beginning of 2024. Oof. Yeah, end of three years. Happy anniversary! <laughs> yeah. How do you feel after three three years? I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, same. <laughs> um, no, it's it's been really great. It's been really fun. Uh, I've gotten to meet a lot of people. I've gotten to travel a little bit and do some really fun things. Uh, got some more fun stuff lined up for 2024. So we'll see what comes of all of that, but we are taking steps to make this thing bigger and better. And yeah. it's just, it's not a question of if. It's it, like before it was a question of if. Now it's definitely a question of when. When. Of like, yeah. oh, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen this year. I think it's, I, I feel good about this year. I do too. Yeah. And, um, and it's great because we're we're on to Strange New Worlds. Which is an amazing series, yes. by the way. I'm so excited to talk about any episode in, in Strange New Worlds. Yeah, because you've been, I mean, you're the executive producer, mm-hmm. but like any good executive producer, you have a good, like, arm's length appreciation <laughs> for Star Trek, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll call it that. That's a good good way to call it. <laughs> right. It's just kind of like, oh, okay, I see what you did there. It's It's nice. <laughs> It's nice. It's fun. Uh, but yeah, it's it's Star Trek, whatever. Yeah. But uh, I distinctly recall the episode where when the credits start, started to roll, you turned to me and were like, okay, now I'm a Star Trek fan. Now I'm a Star Trek fan. And it was an episode of Strange New Worlds. Yes. Not this yeah, episode. Not this episode. But later on down the line. Yeah. So talk about your feelings a little bit pre-podcast. About Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And then once we kind of got into it and we were starting to do stuff with Enterprise and then we shifted into Discovery. Yeah. And then now being here at Strange New Worlds. So talk about that progression a little bit. Well, so pre-podcast, I was not a Star Trek fan. Okay. Um, my uh, Growing up, I had a stepdad for a little while mm-hmm. and um, he's one of those guys that like sat in front of the TV a lot and mm. we had one TV and I wanted to watch stuff like Full House or, you know, things in the 80s and early 90s that kids wanted to watch. My Nickelodeon, all that stuff. He watched Star Trek. Ah. And it was just like, just annoying to a girl, especially just like, ugh. Just like, can we watch anything else? <laughs> and um, nope, you know, the recliner was there. The TV remote was in his hand and, and so I've found something else to do. Ah. Um, it was before, it was the times before kids just like hung in the house. Like we, you know, would run around in the streets with our bikes and all that stuff. So. Ah, ah, yes. Back in the early to mid eighties. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I wasn't a fan until probably the JJ Abrams stuff came out mm. and, um, we watched that and that was brought me back in yeah. um it was really really good and i think that was purposeful right is like the first scene of that is like wanted to make sure the wives were on board oh yeah i mean they they even went as far as to say that specifically yeah. in the director's commentary I yeah think, yeah that, so, that that was the big goal um, and i think they hit the nail on the exactly head. jj you got it you yeah. did it so um definitely started liking it then and really do like the new Trek. Um, and and I, I have a, a good appreciation at this point for, you know, all the old Trek as well. Yeah. Um, but Discovery was, 
it was I don't even know what to say about it, but it was just like it was it was a lot of fun. Discovery and we talked a little bit about this mm-hmm. throughout the episodes uh, here on the show covering Discovery that Discovery broke a lot of molds. Yeah. It, it, you know, even molds that the franchise had set long before Discovery was even a thing, it broke so many molds. So I feel like... It felt like it was a deeper thinker. Like it was just yeah, something that there you were was like, more oh, to wow. It. Yeah, it was more than just the surface like exploration of mm-hmm. space and meeting aliens and different things like that. So, And part of that, and this kind of actually ties into our subject matter today, Ghosts of Illyria, was the diversity. Uh, not only in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. We were getting new types of stories told from different perspectives. This episode, Ghosts of Illyria, there's a lot of themes that uh, come up. There's a couple big things that I think are most prevalent, and that's A, Pike and Spock are in peril down on the planet, and they have no idea what's what they're up against. Meanwhile! <laughs> on the ship, you've got Una, who is without captain and without science officer so you know her her comrades in arms her you know resources in terms of uh you know thoughtfulness and ideas and all that stuff are taken away and she's left in command so any i any thoughts to you know pike and spock and what they're dealing with on the planet versus what una deals with on the ship i think una like you could see her really step up Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and maybe it's just, we haven't seen her in that light before, but, um, but she, she took it and ran with it. Like there was no questioning her leadership abilities, mm-hmm. um, during the entire episode, um, which I think, you know, when we, when it's revealed in the end, her true identity, mm-hmm. um, I, I think that helps play into, it's like, I don't care. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's just, Okay. Great. That tells me a little bit more about you, but it's more, but it's, you're, you're an amazing leader. You're an amazing person. You're an amazing number one. You know, yeah, all of that. Pike's, Pike's vibe of like, I don't care what the regulations yeah. say. Yeah. 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 Um, for Pike and Spock, it was just interesting to see them kind of figure out, you know, without anyone speaking to them around them, mm-hmm. kind of how things were working on that planet. Mm-hmm. So, um, and trying to deduce everything when you didn't, when you really don't think anyone's there. Yeah. It's, it reminded me a little bit of the Doctor Who episode, um, The Werewolves. Oh my God, they're werewolves! David Tennant and Rose Tyler are trapped in that library and they're, the werewolf is on the outside. And so they are stuck in this room surrounded by books. Pike and Spock are trapped in this room with nothing but the records of these people who just aren't there anymore. Yeah. And they're having to figure out what to do. And all they have is records. Yeah. (laughs) So it's a mad scramble to either figure out what uh, happened and try to combat it or something else. Um, It all, you know, talking about Una um, in command on the ship, it kind of made me think of, Everybody's thoughts about, uh, you know, early on in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when we saw Black Widow interacting with Hawkeye. Just like Budapest all over again. You and I remember Budapest very differently. It was like, oh, there's a long history there. Yeah. And I think part of Una stepping up is because she has served in Starfleet for so long. A lot of people are championing you know, another legacy series, uh, either Deep Space Nine or the continuing adventures of Seven and Rafi and uh, Jack on uh, the Enterprise G. Um, but honestly, I would love to see Una before Enterprise. Yeah, that'd be and, fun. Yeah, because she obviously has a relationship a little bit with Pike, but also with Lon. Like, she, oh, she that's knows right. Lon. Yeah. So I think getting those two, getting their story, you know, revealed through backstory and different uh, flashbacks and things like that would be a lot of fun. So there's a lot going on in this episode and uh, we can't really talk much more about it without getting into the spoilers. So before we go any further, let's get to this week's recap. Brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, Rev J, Jerry Antimano, Cosmic Crit. 
Kitty B. David Willett, Ed Milner, Fleet Admiral First Class Fred Sims, and Wren, and Space Monkey 73. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. We have a situation. Landing party members are showing symptoms of some kind of contamination. What are you doing? They're being attracted to light. Computer and simulation. What did you do that for? I want to feel the radiance on my skin. It's a thousand degrees. It'll kill you. It's only a matter of time before we all become infected. Does that thing have a setting for stun? I am arming us with knowledge. Enterprise investigates the disappearance of a colony of Illyrians who are banned by the Federation due to their genetic engineering. As an ion storm approaches, members of the away team return to the ship after unknowingly contracting a virus that makes them addicted to light. Una's immune because she's an Illyrian. <laughs> which she reveals so a cure can be synthesized from her blood. Whoa, that was close. <laughs> Trapped by the storm, Pike and Spock determined that the colonists were attempting to reverse their genetic modifications so they could join the Federation. They may have created the virus and transformed into plasma-like beings. The pair are protected from the storm by those beings and return to Enterprise once everyone is cured. Later, Una attempts to resign, but Pike refuses. She wonders whether he would have shown more prejudice if she had not helped save the crew. Then, Una learns that the virus got through the ship's filter because Chief Medical Officer Dr. Joseph Mbanga is using an outdated transporter. Things that make you, Things that make you go. This holds his daughter, Rukia, in stasis until he can find a cure for her rare disease. What pop culture melodies make your Mondays magical? Is it the soundtrack or score to a mainstream movie? How about shows like Goosebumps or The X-Files? Maybe it's this little ditty. You can get all these and more from Enjoy the Ride Records. Enjoy the Ride Records is a Long Island, New York-based record label, specializing in cult-following reissues throughout a variety of genres, working with a group of diverse licensing partners throughout the entertainment industry to help create albums in a unique, limited-release format since 2008. Enjoy the Ride Records collaborates with companies and artists alike to ensure a quality product is created using the highest quality audio and artwork sources available. Right now, Computer Resume podcast listeners save 10% on Star Trek The Motion Picture, the director's edition, music composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith, by using the coupon code COMPUTERRESUMEPOD exclusively at enjoytheriderecords.com. And Computer Resume Podcast Patreon supporters at the $10 level or higher will get a special code for an additional 15% off. That's right, a total of 25% off the motion picture score just for being a Patreon supporter. So what are you waiting for? Go to patreon.com and sign up before the end of February 2024 to get your code while supplies last. And remember... No matter what you're listening to or where you're going, enjoy the ride. Hello, this is Elizabeth Dennehy from Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Picard, and you are listening to Computer Resume Podcast. So yeah, right off the bat, we kind of see them, you know, as soon as we join the crew opening scene down on the planet like things are already that storm is looking bad right <laughs> and it is coming so yeah. um you know let's talk about uh that storm uh, did it give you any sort of flashbacks of living in florida where every day was just kind of like <laughs> well there might be a hurricane today we'll see the funny thing about florida is when you know when a storm comes, half the time you have these hurricane parties and most people who've yeah. lived in Florida all their lives just yeah. don't even care anymore. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> they're so used to it. They they have, you know, they have the 
precautions in place. They have everything that they need. So mm-hmm. um, they end up having, you know, get togethers and stuff like that. Right. Um, now, of course, there's been some really bad hurricanes that have made some terrible disasters, but it's just not the same. People who like us who moved to Florida mm. and experienced something like that for the first time were just like, panicking or like what do we do you know so Mm -hmm. we're probably the ones made fun of they were all stayed really calm yeah um i mean the only thing that was kind of anxiety ridden was trying to get um comms you know to work and make sure that they could you know communicate properly and get back on the ship i guess spock was off doing his own thing so we had to go find spock yeah he was Um, in a you know which it was odd to me that he was off by himself and you would think they would use the buddy system. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But, um, yeah, Something. they, yeah, they didn't, uh, they didn't have that in place. And then of course, when the communicators are down, they got a, you know, they got a hustle and it's already too late. They're right. stuck. Yeah. Um, so then we see that, uh, Lon ha- or not Lon, um, Ortegas mm-hmm. has a weird interaction with, <laughs> uh, one of the crewmen in the hallway who strips off all his clothes and then puts his head through glass, <laughs> like trying to get to the light. Yep. Um, Cause this is, I mean, that was almost like a scene from a horror movie or something yeah, crazy like that. Yeah. Makes me think of those types of psychological movies where like something's going on behind the surface mm-hmm. and they put on this face. And then when, when the curtain falls and it's revealed, they're just kind of like, Oh yeah, you caught me. And then, like, you see the monster, like, come out of them. There's stuff like that. I always think of uh, Will Graham talking to Hannibal Lecter at the beginning of Red Dragon, Mm -hmm. where you can see Will is just hovering right around the answer. And then, you know, Hannibal Lecter comes in and puts that air or puts that uh, stiletto between Will's ribs. And then while Will's laying on the ground, he gets this, you know, Hannibal gets this sort of calm yet sinister look on his face of just kind of like i think i'll eat your heart of just like oh my god <laughs> i guess i was thinking more of someone's taken over someone else's body but movies like that where you've got uh that deal with like demon possession and mm-hmm. stuff like that of course classically the exorcist exorcist yeah so the person is just haggard with you know cuts on their face usually and there's usually been some sort of bodily fluid excreted from their nose mouth eyes whatever there's you know their hair's a mess but then they say something just so chilling yeah like, oh my gosh know, and 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 of course their eyes are usually like glazed over mm-hmm. or black but they say something just so so creepy yeah i think i would that's what i was expecting when he was like banged his head through the glass and looked at the light it was some kind of like it's so beautiful uh, yeah yeah <laughs> because you were home uh. <laughs> <laughs> well you know and i think uh going back to our discussion last week with ren sims we were talking about how capable the crew of the enterprise is yeah I, really everyone in starfleet they always seem to have their stuff together yeah. and uh you know super intelligent even the lower deckers are very, very oh my gosh yeah are very capable like scientists and officers and the whole thing yeah. so to see somebody lose it like that very um aggressively by just putting their head through i mean it's not glass that's a that's a highly advanced spaceship which yeah. means he had to do that really, really hard. And how his head survived that, <laughs> I don't know. know. How he didn't just lose consciousness <laughs> mm-hmm. right then. Yeah, that was that was really, really bizarre. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about... We see Una have a really unique reaction uh, in her room. We see her also attracted to the lamp, but then we see her skin start to glow and it's revealed she's an Illyrian. Yeah. You not being the biggest Star Trek fan going way back, but have been around me long enough, know that the genetic modifications, the stuff that brought about Khan and things that happened, you watched Picard with me and, you know, the augments, all of that stuff was uh, was prevalent in there as well. Even some episodes of Enterprise yeah. had augments. You're at least aware of what that means in this world. I guess maybe, but I don't know. I I didn't initially, I was like, okay. Mm. (laughs) Um, I didn't really think about 
what that meant when when that was revealed okay. or or really feel like it was an oh my goodness you know yeah kind of moment um it was just more of it, well cuz there's so many it, it's just weird to think about it. it's there's so many you know other species mm-hmm. that are within starfleet and that they want to get to know i can't it's hard to remember or imagine that they're anti any kind of species of yeah. creature of, of of alien of anything because they're so wanting that harmonious society mm-hmm. so you know to have any kind of prejudice against a type of of species is is complicated and and, and rough to kind of understand you yeah. know or or realize that that's the case initially or that was the the reveal so it takes a minute to kind of say oh okay that that's what is going on here but again the crew had except for lawn i mean the the one main one, you know, the captain, when mm-hmm. he finds out later on, I know we're not going in order, but, um, you know, he, he had a similar thing. It's just like, I know how great you are, you know, so I don't really care, Yeah, you know, what made you who you are because I care about who you are. Yeah. Now, Lon is a little bit different. She feels a little bit more betrayed because I think that from her family's how they've been treated and everything like that. And just not knowing this about someone so close to her, mm-hmm. I think she felt like she was kept in the dark on something that is really important. Yeah. It's, you know, being kept in the dark by your closest friend, coupled with childhood trauma, mm-hmm. coupled with the very real, the very real drama and horror of what her ancestor was a part of. Yeah. You know, all of that kind of, it's a perfect storm that's brewing under the surface of Lon, Noni, and Sang. Yeah. So, yeah, there's some really interesting things going on in Lon. But I think this episode, looking at Lon and her thoughts about everything, I feel like this is one of those episodes where it's Star Trek at its best. Talking about issues that are very prevalent in yes. the world today. Under the guise of science fiction. Yeah. And, I, you know, for listeners, uh, we just finished watching uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You know, it's a sitcom about the quirky cops in, in New York City. There's a couple of episodes in those, especially in those later seasons, dealing with racism, dealing with police brutality and the mistreatment of individuals by law enforcement. And I couldn't help but see some of that here where Una is a decorated officer, but she knows that if she says anything because of who she is, it means not only being expelled, but probably persecuted and imprisoned. Yeah. Just because of who she is. Just because of her DNA that she had nothing to do. Like she couldn't help. And I feel like the, uh, not to slight, but the plight of the Illyrians could speak to a lot of different groups of people. Sure. Um, women, uh, the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. uh, African Americans, mm-hmm. Native Americans, uh, <laughs> any minority. Yeah, honestly. any minority. Any did did any of this stick out for you? And you know, did you have any thoughts about how it was presented in Star Trek versus seeing it in the world? I think I think it's still Star Trek is still showing us how we can be the best of ourselves. Mm. Um, so again, Pike should be one that we should be emulating. Yeah, and you know, it's not about your DNA; it's about who you are as a person. Mm. Even further than that, I don't know that the episode showed us that, but it's just like you're worthy because you're human. You're worthy because you're here. You know, yeah. there's there's important messages into some of that guru type stuff today is like you know it's it's just you know know your worth with regardless of any of it regardless of your bank account regardless of your job regardless of your grades regardless of any of it it's just like you're human you're valuable you know or you know again for this for for star trek you're a species you exist in the world you know you're valuable yeah not to get too much more personal into this but i wanted to ask you as someone who has worked in the corporate world since college, um, you know, did you ever feel did you did you ever did you ever feel like Una, where it was just kind of like I can't say things or I can't do things because of whatever? 
I think her speech at the end, her her personal log, hit me um, because maybe not that I couldn't say certain things um, the way you've just put it, but it was more it was more about how you present yourself mm. and bringing light to like all parts of you. So I know I've definitely I I feel like I have different personas based on the group of people you know that I'm hanging out with. Mm. Um, and and it's when you struggle with that, you struggle with your own identity sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Kat, Catherine, Katie, Kate, um, all of those end up being a different name I use. I have used in different groups of people. Mm. So Catherine was work, and she was her own persona. And and Kate uh, was a lot with my father's side of the family. Katie was my mother's side of the family. Cat with my friends. And, you know, so it's like cats probably cats, the one that's the most like me, but they all have, you know, of course, bits and pieces of me. But we're you you try to fit that mold so you fit in best with that group. Yeah. So, you know, I'm putting on a face to go to work. I'm putting on a mask to go to work. Yeah. So that I I'm giving them exactly what they want and I can succeed. Yeah. And but is that really the best way to be, especially thinking about Una's position in the starship, uh, Umbenga's position in the starship? Like you're with these people all day long. Yeah. You know, they are your they are your coworkers and your friends and they become your family. And it's so it's different than than our world where we go to work and we have our work people. We come home and we have our family and we go out with our friends and and have them. So it's like, it's almost different places and, and, and all that stuff. But on the starship, it's like, you have to kind of mix and, and blend all of that. Yeah. Um, and so you, but you do have to get to that point where you feel comfortable enough that you can share who you are. Mm -hmm. Or in her case, she she was unfortunately have having to out herself because she had to tell what was going on and how she could potentially help the entire crew. Um, Getting into Umbega and and what was going on with him. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go next. And so he's hiding that he's got his daughter's life force, basically. Uh, yeah, it's basically he he's got her pattern in the buffer. But basically, yeah. when you transport someone from point A to point B, in the middle, they're kind of a digital chemical <laughs> goop <laughs> energy yeah. type they are reduced to energy yeah so yeah um and it so basically suspends her in animation so. yeah that's really vulnerable for him and oh, yeah. unfortunately again he's kind of outed when he's having to like do that and he was in another position it felt like that he was going he he was okay well he wasn't really okay with it but he was just he was going to let his daughter go to be able to do what the ship needed to do mm-hmm. and luckily una was like no we'll figure it out we'll we'll will do X, Y, Z instead. And even though that's all science jargon that I didn't fully follow, yeah. but it was like, um, you know, he was able to kind of open that up and share and realize that that's, you know, okay, I can tell people about this and why this is so important to me. And of course it's his daughter. But on the other hand of that, like I was really worried about him and I, you know, I still am with these, the series is like, are you holding on to something we hold on to people so long because yeah. we just don't want to let them go. Right. But is that causing her more harm in the end yeah. than, you know, by putting her into this stasis where she's not really living and she's not able to move on to after that, you know, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. So it's really, really sad. Yeah. Um, and it's good that, that he's able to now talk about it though because he needs to he needs to have that conversation with people and and maybe they can help him with what's going on maybe you know but i don't know just opening up is so wait as, uh, going back to your question about you know the corporate world when you do start opening up and and being a little bit more vulnerable with people and telling them you know it does bring that humanity into that rigor of just mm. pushing buttons and and doing formulas or whatever, whatever your job is. So it's like, it kind of reminds you why you're here yeah, and what you're really doing. And, you know, and, and you, and then you also need to find ways to help each other. Mm-hmm. So you're not, 
you're like, why didn't you get this done? Well, because I've got someone in the hospital or I've got someone dying or I've got, you know, this other deadline here. And, you know, you're just like, okay, well, let's talk about it and, yeah. and let's let, let me help you figure it out. So yeah. being vulnerable with others around you is, is really, um, is a power move actually, if you can do it. Yeah. It's, I mean, cause it's, they're in an interesting position because once, once you start blurring that line between colleagues, coworkers, subordinates, officers, and friends, friends that you consider family, like the job gets a little bit trickier. Yeah. And they're out in the middle of space, <laughs> it, you know, one wrong move and everyone dies. Right. <laughs> and maybe, and maybe best case scenario, it's just everyone on the ship, <laughs> let alone a everyone. planet or a solar system right. or something like that. So um, going back and getting a little more specific with Dr. Mbenga, what are we looking at in terms of, um, because I think we've discussed uh, just in, you know, a little bit surface details that your job involves uh, medical, the medical profession. So looking at what Dr. Mbenga is doing and what he had done, which kind of put them in this scenario if something like this were to happen in a, I mean, it's a, it's a weird situation to be like, well, if <laughs> well, this happened happen real today. life, yeah, yeah, what would happen? But like, we're talking about a medical professional right? who uh, specifically uh, did not update their equipment, which yeah. doctors have to stay on top of the practices. Otherwise, they're open to liability. Lawsuits. Yeah, mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. And while nobody was... Harmed. I don't think there was any loss of life. I don't think so. Um, just nuttiness. Yeah, just yeah, some <laughs> nuttiness. If if this were to happen, you know, or a sim- or a similar situation, like he could potentially lose. Oh, he his could lose credentials. His, and, yeah, like you know. his job is license. He's not. Pro- he's not ever doing what he's been doing because he didn't follow the appropriate rules. We're so. S- <laughs> We're honestly, it's such a weird time. We're so strict, but we don't have the right rules in place in a lot of cases. So yeah. it's just, it's like we're holding people accountable for things that, it, I don't know, it's these weird scenarios of, of not putting the right controls into place and then holding people accountable um, 100% and not really sharing in and talking about and properly debriefing on what could we have done better. Yeah. And, and the right training and guidance before and after something like that could happen to maybe have someone we're, we're such a cancel culture, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and that's one way we cancel doctors. So it's just, it's just like, Nope, you're done. You get out, you know, nurses too. And it's it's just, it's insane. And they're people. Everyone's just people. Yeah. And um, I'm not saying that there's not plenty of doctors that have done terrible. Oh my God terrible things and nurses too. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not talking about those at all, but it's, it's more about it, where, where are we falling down at the, at the root cause? Um, and I feel like I'm getting way off track from keeping your daughter in a buffer. <laughs> um, no, but this is good stuff. <laughs> um, Cause this, I, you know, this cannot happen today or it's impossible today, but we do keep people probably alive longer than we morally, ethically, potentially uh-huh. should. Yeah. Um, or flip side, you know, maybe we like, nope, we want organs or this or that. And we, you know, don't fight hard enough. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's when you get into crossing um, rules with ethics, um, it's, it, it gets really complicated yeah because i think with everything that dr mbenga does and goes through you know obviously we don't have pattern buffers we don't have transporters (laughs) we can't do that but i know that there was um probably you know is probably some time ago but i think there's always been a discussion of like cryogenically preserving people yeah and which is sorry i wasn't thinking about that no no (laughs) you know because that's kind of that kind of plays into what happens with khan Mm -hmm. that you know kirk finds khan down the road in cryogenic stasis and brings him out and the shenanigans of (laughs) space seed and then wrath of khan ensue but uh you know let me ask you and then we can move on from this 
the the these thoughts about canceling out doctors for one mistake or because of a you know a whole laundry list of issues has this been going on for a while or did it really take center stage covid post covid uh, i think it's been going on longer than that um you know but i i it has a lot of that you know similarities with the cops too mm. um so going back to what you were saying about like nine nine and and different things along those lines it's it's just where we're falling down much sooner than when the incident happened and yeah. and with that particular person yeah um we're falling down with our base education with people mm. um and that's creating the fear the anxiety the the anger that ends up leading to all these terrible things that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so yes, that person needs to be punished. Yes. That, you know, they do wrong, whatever, but you got to start looking further ahead of that and fixing society as a whole. And I think that's where Star Trek kind of helps us think about the future that way. Yeah. You know, and it, cause it kind of makes me think of, you know, doctors who were treating, uh, you know, in the COVID uh, you know, in the midst, in the heaviest part of COVID, who were having to treat multitudes of people without support, without supplies, and, you know, rules got bent, rules got broken to be able to treat these people. Yeah. But it also made me think of, you know, going back to um, marginalized groups, uh, you know, legislation being passed uh, about women's health care and doctors saying, hey, look, you know, rules be damned if you need health care. We're here. Oh, I wish that was the truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's I, any any further thoughts, hopes, <laughs> dreams, wishes for the medical profession based on what we've seen in this episode, and you know, and all of that stuff. I have a lot of hopes. Yeah, I have a lot of hopes for a lot of change. I, I've, you know, I think that was one thing me. I'm getting off on a very personal tangent here, but me coming into the jobs that I've had and uh, I always had this younger idea, hopes, and I can change the world. You know, I know how to fix this. Yeah. I just got to get into the right position, you know, to be able to make a change. Yeah. And unfortunately right now in our society in America, yeah. where we have the healthcare system we have, it's, um, it's very difficult right now to see how it can change without almost crashing. And it's scary. Yeah. It's scary to think that way, but it's, it is in a, in my opinion, an unsustainable model. Mm -hmm. um, it costs too much from all angles, from patients to hospitals, mm -hmm. hospitals are closing left and right. And then you throw in, like you said, the legislation um, with against women's health, against LGBTQ health, you know, people can't get the care that they need because the doctors are too scared that they're going to be sued or take their license away for providing life-saving care, life-affirming care. Yeah. And, um, and of course, all the unfortunate, terrible results of, of racism and a lack of research around um, how things affect different races, different um, genders. You know, when when we're talking about medications, vaccines, you know, yeah. um, protocols, any of it. Um, yeah, there's it's, it's, we're in a tough spot right now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You mentioned something uh, that really stuck out to me. The idea of lack of uh, research, lack of education. Yeah, there's, <laughs> you know, in terms of from my personal perspective on law enforcement, uh, shortly after uh, George Floyd was killed, it made me start thinking about things. And I had, at that point, I was no longer in law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, but I was working as a paralegal. And I started to do some research on law enforcement in this country. And anyone who's curious, the numbers and the statistics are out there. Go find what the uh, legal age to be a law enforcement officer is in your state. Yeah. Go find the required education level for for law enforcement officers in your state and compare them with a few others. And the 
the evidence is shocking. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and don't get me wrong. I worked with a lot of wonderful officers, a lot of really good people, a lot of people I consider very close friends. In fact, we just lost one. Um, my, my good buddy, uh, Brad, who was one of my groomsmen. He was one of my, uh, he was one of my sergeants at the jail, um, uh, recently passed away. Um, and he was such a good guy and he was always there to help people. Um, I was in a bad spot and he got me a job in law enforcement and kind of started turning my life around. But, uh, and we'll miss you, Brad. Um, yes, we will. but, uh, you know, looking at certain things in law enforcement, uh, there are so many issues that seem, that seem like no brainers. Yeah. But then when you start, well, that's not going to happen because it's based on funding. Or it's based on some sort of political thing. And I feel like your sentiment rings true for law enforcement as well. Oh, yeah. It's going to have to crash first. And that's that's scary. that's scary, too. <laughs> so scary. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, weren't you saying that, like, this, the, the start of Star Trek, the start of where they're at today mm -hmm. was after World War III yep. on Earth? Oh, yeah. And they said, we've got to do better. And we actually created a society that did. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 It's... Again, I'm not looking forward to what has to get us there, but... Yeah. Because, I mean, we... Even while I was an officer, for small things to change usually meant something drastic had to happen. Yeah. Which, more often than not, involved someone getting hurt. Yeah. And... You, you hate that it has to come to that. Yeah, it's almost like that's, it kind of goes back to where we learn from our failures, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, what a terrible way to fail. We have to hit that low, low, low before we can bring ourselves, you know, back up. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but I do have hope. And I mean, that Star Trek is really great for that in oh, yeah. instilling hope in people. Absolutely. While I was, and I, this is a, this is just going to sound like me tooting my own horn but while i was in law enforcement um a protocol was in place involving the scheduling of officers we were shorthanded so it involved officers staying long after their shifts and people were you know tired you yeah. know when you get tired you get sloppy you make mistakes you make mistakes people get hurt or worse yeah um i saw the deficiency and i wrote it up and offered a solution and that solution was accepted and I really kind of kept that in the back of my head of like, okay, I went about it the right way and I put it in plain English so everyone could understand. And it was something that everyone could relate to. And at least here in this department, in this little, you know, corner of South Carolina, <laughs> <laughs> I made this tiny, tiny change. Um, I mean, that's what we need more of all across any industry, yeah. any part of life is I feel there's so many of us and I do this regularly too. I'll, I'll admit is like, mm -hmm. we focus on what's wrong rather than focusing on either what's right or the solution to creating, you know, to fixing the wrong. Right. You know? Right. So the more you come up with what that solution and workshop that, however you need to do that. Um, or again, just submit it to the appropriate authorities and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's do that. Let's try it at least. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's an important thing to do to, to not just sit back and do nothing and complain about it. It's like, let's actually get yeah. some solutions put in place. Let's stop pointing fingers at people. Yeah. Let's stop, you know, and take responsibility for what your own actions are too. Cause we all have a, a we're all a part of the problem Yeah. in some little way mm -hmm. or big way, mm -hmm. depending on who you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> um you know that's the vulnerability that we need that's that coming back to the episode that's we need to be vulnerable and show yeah I <laughs> up. yeah i'm i'm not i'm i'm human i'm i'm just or i'm Illyrian. i'm just i'm just me yeah you know and accept me please for who i am that's what we're always wanting from people around us yeah. Well, folks, we've talked about these issues uh, that were presented so well by the uh, actors and uh, everybody involved in this episode. 
But as we do every week, good or bad, we always ask the question, who do we blame? This episode was written by Akila Cooper, who hails from Haiti, Missouri. Uh, she's a graduate of Truman State University. Uh, she got a degree in creative writing in 03 and received her MFA uh, from the USC School of Cinema and Television, uh, where she was the first recipient of the NAACP CBS Writers Fellowship. Woo! Yeah, congratulations. Uh, her first credit was season one, episode 12 of Tron Uprising. That was back in 2012. And then she worked on 20 episodes of Grimm, seven episodes of The 100. Four episodes of Luke Cage. I know we both really Oh my God, I love Luke Cage. Luke Cage was really, really <laughs> great. Uh, the first episode that she worked on in Luke Cage, uh, season one, episode seven, Manifest, was actually nominated for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Writing in a Dramatic Series. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Her first film in 2018 was Hellfest, uh, which she wrote with Seth M. Sherwood and Blair Butler, based on a story by William Pennock, Christopher Say, and Stephen Susco. That sounds like a horror movie, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was a horror movie. Like, you've seen a lot of some of the really great writers and uh, directors in Star Trek are very well versed in multiple genres oh, yeah. of storytelling, yeah. be it... Uh, romance, drama, sci-fi, action, horror, like musical, musicals, <laughs> <laughs> but that comes later. <laughs> but Hellfest also featured Star Trek alum, Tony Todd. And then, uh, she also wrote Malignant in 2021 based on the story she developed with director James Wan and executive producer Ingrid Bissou, uh, which also stars Star Trek alum, Annabelle Wallace. Uh, does An the name Annabelle Wallace ring a bell for you? No. She played Grace Shelby in <gasps> Peaky Blinders. Oh my gosh, we just finished watching that series yeah. and we loved it so much. Tommy Shelby's first wife, yeah, who, yeah. um, plays a big, big role in that, well, definitely in that first season, but she pops up. Oh yeah. Throughout. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, her, her, uh, her character arc is an interesting one. It's for very her. interesting. Oh yeah. Uh, so, Akila Cooper, this is her first writing in the franchise, but not her last. And this episode was also written by Bill Walkoff. Uh, his first credit was season one, episode 10 of The Closer, My Best Friend's Funeral, starring Tom Selleck's mustache. And then <laughs> um, he did 19 episodes of Tron Uprising from 2012 to 2013, where he perhaps met Akila Cooper? Who's to say? We don't know. Hmm. But we're seeing a lot of hmm. that, you know, looking at... Some of these creative folks, uh, you know, when they're working on Star Trek, it might not be the first time they've worked together. So it's always interesting to see where those paths crossed and, yeah. you know, who met whom where and yeah. all that stuff. Bill also went on to do three episodes of an animated show from that other franchise uh, from 2015 to 2016. And then 23 episodes of Once Upon a Time from 2015 to 2016. This is... His first writing in the franchise, but not his last. So we'll see both of those writers pop up again. But this episode was directed by Leslie Hope, born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. So, you know, she's very nice. Graduated from St. Michael's University School at Victoria, British Columbia in 1982. Tell us all about it. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Her first credit was Ups and Downs in 1983. But then uh, right after that was her first television credit, which was two episodes of Days of Our Lives from 1983 to 1984, playing the character of Janet Nelson. We always give some shout outs to our folks who spent some time doing the soaps. That's a that's a tough racket, the soaps. Uh, she also did 12 episodes of Behringer's in 85. She played the title role in The Education of Allison Tate in 1986. Then she had the role of Laura in Oliver Stone's Talk Radio, alongside Eric Bogosian, John C. McGinley, and Alec Baldwin. She played the love interest, Susan Wilkins, in writer-director Emilio Estevez's Men at Work, and that was in 1990, starring Estevez and his brother Charlie Sheen. And then she appeared in Season 2, Episode 4 of Sequest DSV, 2032, uh, two episodes of Early Edition. Do you remember Early Edition? Yeah, I think 
think I do. The Was guy, it news? yeah, the guy receives the the next day's newspaper, yeah. so he's got twenty four hours to change whatever uh, whatever he can. Yeah, yeah. that was fun. <laughs> that was a fun show. I really liked that show. But Leslie Hope's first appearance in the franchise was actually back in Deep Space Nine, season six, episode seventeen. Wrongs Darker Than Death or Night. That was back in 1998. She played Kira Norris's mom, which is funny because Leslie Hope is eight years younger than the non visitor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, anyways, that's a fun little. Ah, uh, uh, makeup. Oh, yes, makeup. <laughs> uh, and then, in terms of guest stars, we've got uh, one guy I'd like to focus on this week uh, Andre De Kim as Chief John Kyle. Uh, here we've got another Canadian. He was born in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, he attended University of Toronto, Miss. I'm a okay, Mississauga. <laughs> I had to read that a couple times to make sure I got that right. Mississauga and Sheridan's College. Uh, his first credit is actually the same as his third credit, his fourth <laughs> credit, and his seventh credit. I already said it. He's Canadian, so you can probably guess it's Degrassi. Uh, he he played Winston Chu on Degrassi in multiple different uh, series of Degrassi. Uh, but then he was also did episodes of Shit's Creek, American Gods, and Lock and Key. <gasps> oh yeah, a Lock and Key. Yeah, I know you love Lock I and really Creek. Love Lock and key. Oh, and you love Shit's Creek. Too. I do love Shit's Creek. I was going to ask you what he played in Shit's Creek. Uh it was a uh, one episode. It was oh, okay. yeah, minor character role. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, but his first appearance was actually uh, Strange New Worlds, uh, Season 1, Episode 1, Strange New Worlds, uh, which we discussed with comedian Patrick Cunningham back on Episode 118. So, Kat, first of all, thank you so much for carving out the time to discuss <laughs> this episode. Me. Yeah, to come all the way to my office. <laughs> <laughs> From the living room. <laughs> From the living room. <laughs> uh, to discuss this episode with me. Uh, but this episode, The Ghosts of Illyria... Is this essential viewing? If somebody is sitting down and working their way through Star Trek for the very first time, and they come to this episode, Ghosts of Illyria, is this one that they can skip, or is this a must-see episode? You know, I think it's really interesting with Strange New Worlds, because it's gone back to that episodic format, mm -hmm. um, where, or Freak of the Week, or whatever you want to oh, call yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, where it typically, like, that particular storyline is, you know, within that episode, and you don't necessarily have to play it, or ha it doesn't necessarily connect. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the way they're connecting it is through the character development. Mm -hmm. And so the characters are having all these storylines, you know, or we're building up and we're understanding these characters better through, right. throughout. So while the story that's in here... Um, of this infection or contagion of of this even the planet that they're on and the ion storm mm -hmm. i don't feel that that's like necessarily something that i mean maybe it'll come back later but right now it's like it's not necessarily something that ha you have to know about yeah but but the character thing the character identities that come out in mm -hmm. this particular episode I think are really important because especially again, not to give something away to anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but, um, Una's identity reveal. Yeah. Um, this results in something big later on. Oh, very much. Um, Umbenga too. Yeah. So these tiny little things like that are just seconds or minutes within one episode mm -hmm. will be something bigger later on. Oh, so yeah. yeah, it's probably, it's probably something you have to watch to, to be able to what's coming to be able to, to feel that a little bit more. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Looking at um, the overall story. Um, yeah, you could probably skip it. But mm -hmm. if you're following specifically Una's track yep. or Una's character arc or Dr. Mbenga's character arc, yep. which we still have not really gotten everything from Una just yet. No. But we definitely know, based on the first two seasons of S Strange New Worlds, that Dr. Mbenga's character arc gets deep and heavy yep. quick. So I think seeing this first seeing this first glimpse of what is going on behind surface level with Dr. Mbenga is really important. Yeah. And I think seeing knowing what Una's character 
sets up in the future, not just in this series, but other series as well. Yeah. Um, it starts right here. Yeah. It starts with this episode. Plus, it's also great to see Pike, as you mentioned, when presented with this thing of like, well, I'd, you know, I'm, I've broken the rules. I have to, and seeing the type of leader he is, we've, you know, on multiple episodes championed, um, you know, Anson Mountain, his performances, uh, you know, Captain Pike. But here again, we see the good leader making a good decision, yeah. <laughs> being a good leader. I welcome that discussion. Yes. You know, I mean, he's just, he's ready for it. He's yeah. just like, let me defend you and mm -hmm. I will be there. Yeah. So. Yeah. And yeah. it's, ugh, ah, ah, for more leaders Don't like we, that. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't we would love a boss like that. <laughs> Always have your back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someday. Maybe. Oh, Fingers crossed. Knocking mm -hmm. on wood. <laughs> Well, as I said before, Kat, thank you so much for uh, sitting in, carving out the time, making notes and chatting with me about this episode. I love you dearly. I love you too, darling. And uh, and thank you for three wonderful years. How has it been three years? Like time is this, I don't understand it. It's wild. It's, it's got me sucked in these days. And yeah. I'm just like, nope, that's not right. That can't be right. That's not right. <laughs> You know, when I when we first started talking about this, and I did the math of uh, how many episodes there were, how many, how, what you were going through, and I yeah. kind of estimated about fifteen years that yeah. this was going to be. You're one fifth of the way to that. I know. <laughs> we're moving right along, but at the same time, like they keep producing stuff. So yeah, <laughs> so that fifteen years may be more like that finishing 20? that that finishing line is getting further and further yeah. away. <laughs> Well, uh, folks, yes, if you've listened to this show for any length of time, or if this is your first episode, Welcome. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. And thank you for joining us uh, on our third anniversary. And just to, um, you know, as we do with every uh, season, with every uh, year anniversary, I've got some people to thank. They are wonderful, wonderful people. I can't express how much these folks mean to me uh, in their work with the franchise, in the franchise, as fans, or anything else that they are a part of. These are wonderful people. Uh, please listen to their episodes, uh, hear them share their love of Star Trek and their thoughts on not only Star Trek, but other things, as we do on this on this uh, little show that's kind of about Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but from the Star Trek Chronology Project, Jason Keener, author of Dink, Michael LeBlanc, artist Sensei Ha, and we have parody musician Ian Starrecked Ramsey. From the BQN Network, Davey Willett, Amy Nelson, Matt Jennings. Comedians Patrick Cunningham, Melly Kazel, Danny Rydell, and Ben Jennings. From Con the Musical, Brent Black. Superfans Kevin Hebenstreit and Ren Sims. Trekfest in Riverside, Iowa. Thank you so much, Travis Riggin. Star Trek drag star Flip Kiki, comic pros Heather Antos and J.K. Woodward, my fellow podcasters Drew Burris, Gary Horn, Justin Bishop, and Frank Bailey. From Modifius Entertainment, the Star Trek Adventures project manager Jim Johnson, and Star Trek alum Connor Trenier, Elizabeth Dennehy, and Chase Masterson. Thank you all so much for everything, uh, for sitting with me, talking with me, if it was for a few minutes, if it was for a few hours, I'm looking at you, Flip Kiki, you're <laughs> six hours and eight minutes, you crashed my computer twice. <laughs> but everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. What an amazing lineup. Yeah, it's a pretty great lineup. <laughs> That's Guys, thanks you so much for supporting this show, this little show, and, and just chatting. Yeah. Yeah, just with my on husband, chat. even though you're keeping him from other things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you, Flip Kiki. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, in two weeks on March the 4th, we will be joined by Drew Burris from the More You Nerd podcast to discuss Strange New Worlds, Season 1, Episode 4, Memento Mori, which is available exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Cat. Where can people find you on the internet? I'm on Instagram at that.darn.cat with a K. 
And I am at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all of the socials from all of us at the Computer Resume Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in 10 forward. on Patreon and like, rate, review, and share on all your favorite platforms. Feel free to send us your subspace transmissions to computerresumepodcasts at gmail.com or at Computer Resume on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The Computer Resume Podcast was created and produced by Mr. Todd A. Davis. Our logo was designed by Will Martin and Justin Bishop. The opening theme was produced by Justin Bishop, and our outro music was provided with permission by Dronode. Additional music was provided by Mr. Todd A. Davis and Gary Horn, and the voice of Computer Resume Podcast and executive producer, me, Kat Davis. Hashtag LLAP. We'll see you next time. Going through a Star Trek. <laughs> We're doing Star Trek stuff in space. <laughs> We probably got some phasers and shuttle pods, and we're gonna find a brand new race. Hi, I'm executive producer Kat Davis. We've had a lot of fun here tonight, but you know what's not fun? Sun addiction. Only four crew members of the USS Enterprise were unaffected by sun addiction. Granted, one of them was an alien, one was asleep, and the other two weren't even on the ship, but that's beside the point. If you or someone you know is addicted to the sun, please contact your doctor or counselor during their normal business hours and arm yourself with knowledge, because then you'll know, and knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe! How's that for a slice of fried gold?